Ukraine's highly anticipated counteroffensive has so far failed to show significant victories, with dire consequences for its troops. A shortage of ammunition and less support from the West have brought the war against Russia to a standstill. Many Ukrainians are dreading the approaching winter because of renewed Russian attacks on critical infrastructure. And they're also worried about being abandoned by the West altogether. Will the winter bring a war of exhaustion that will further jeopardize Ukrainian integrity and independence? On to the point we ask, failing against Russia, can Ukraine survive the war? Welcome to this week's To The Point. I'm Javier Arguedas. It's good to have you with us. And I'm joined by today's guests. Gesine Dornblüt is a radio journalist and author and former correspondent for Germany's Deutschlandfunk in Russia. Roman Goncharenko is my DW colleague from Ukraine, currently working with DW's Russian service in Bonn. And Gustav Gressel is a senior policy fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations here in Berlin. To all of you, thank you. Thank you for being with us today. Now, Gazina, I'd like to start with you. The situation in the Middle East has certainly drawn attention away from the war in Ukraine, but there also just haven't been major breakthroughs in the war in Ukraine for weeks or even months. How would you describe this moment in the Russian-Ukraine war? I think it's a very, very critical moment because, um, as you said, the situation on the front is somehow stuck. Um, even you could say that Russia gains initiative again, uh, especially in the east of Ukraine. At the same time, you have Vladimir Putin saying that only pretending to be ready to negoti negotiate, but this is nothing but empty words. Um, indeed, he has the same goals for his war as he had earlier. He wants the whole Ukraine and more. And at the same time, you have the Ukrainian population. Um, people are really afraid of the upcoming winter. And this uh, psychological element is, I think, very, very worrisome and very important for the whole situation. It's certainly hard to watch what's going on right now. Roman, Ukraine had promised a counteroffensive that would win back territory taken by Russia by the end of this fall here in Europe. It failed, according to Ukraine's own Valery Zaluzhny. What went wrong? Well, Zaluzhny uh, basically says that um, the reason for, for, the, um, for, the, for the situation we are in now, which is, some say it's a stalemate, some say we are close to it, but anyway, the situation is very dynamic, so I wouldn't call it a stalemate at this moment, because Russia is still trying to push. Um, the main reason, according to the Ukrainian chief commander, Valery Zaluzhny, you've been quoting, is um, that uh, the level of technology, uh, all those drones and surveillance equipment, they do not allow for either side to um, collect a lot of forces in one place. So uh, to have enough power for a breakthrough. So Ukraine can do it, Russia can do it as well. But Russia has much more soldiers, much more heavy equipment. And Ukraine um, has to be very much, very, very careful with, with, with its soldiers because it has uh, much less resources than Russia, which is obvious. And this is one of the major reasons. So his, his message is we need to find a technological solution for this war to win because we cannot uh, expect anymore that uh, more tanks or uh, more, more uh, military um, jets will help us. Uh, to achieve a, a quick victory. So it will be a long war. And we need to be sure that the West continues to support us, but we also need to be looking for a, a technological solution. This is, this is how he explains it. He seems to be very realistic, also maybe not that optimistic. President Volodymyr Zelensky, Gustav, still appears to be very confident that Ukraine will win this war. Is he the only one? Well, the problem is he has um, some reason to say that, because... Uh, unlike in the West, where most people expect a stalemate to lead into a ceasefire, to lead into a frozen conflict, which is what the Chancellor or President Biden wants in the long run, um, he knows that there are basically two outcomes of this war. Russia wins or Ukraine wins. The, the Russian president is not playing for a stalemate. Uh, they want to conquer Ukraine. And either Ukrainians prevail in the war and prevent that and push the Russians out, or the Russians achieve that over a long war of attrition that they win in 2027, 2028, roughly. 
Um, so he has to alert the West uh, that the war is not pointless and not to expect a ceasefire in the next six months and, and to burst these illusions. However, militarily, yes, it, it is a situation where you uh, have uh, almost no chance on major breakthroughs and regaining territory. If you look, there's a Twitter account called War Mapper, and they have also a chart where they uh, plot the square kilometers won by either side. So you have first the big Russian incursion and big Russian win, then you have the Ukrainian counteroffensive. So you see large Ukrainian wins, but you see the curve of territorial change is going down basically from March, April, is going going down, 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 down. It's on getting smaller sides. on both sides, yeah. both on the Russian and Ukraine side, getting smaller, smaller, smaller. Um, and that is that is the tricky thing because Ukraine more than Russia. Russia can win this as a long war for attrition, but Ukraine, for their strategy of success to get to the Sea of Azov, to isolate Crimea, to force Russia on the negotiation table by taking Crimea hostage, they need maneuver warfare, uh, and that's uh, unfortunately, of course, not in the cards for now. We're going to have a closer look at the situation on the front because it, if, if it is a stalemate, it can only be described as a very bloody one. Small territorial gains on both sides are paid for with a heavy death toll. We're now approaching the second winter since Russia invaded Ukraine. Six months ago, Ukraine launched a counteroffensive, but so far, victory remains elusive. The fighting continues and casualties are increasing. Near Avdivka in the northern Donetsk region, Russian troops tried to breach several points along the eastern border to improve their position before winter. Ukrainian forces are defending themselves with drones and cluster munitions. By contrast, the Ukrainian military says it is making progress near the embattled city of Kherson, located on the left bank of the Dnipro River. But despite intense battles, the territorial gains on both sides are only marginal. This is one of the reasons why even the commander-in-chief of the Ukrainian army issued a warning of a military stalemate. Can Ukraine still win this war? That's, of course, the big question now, Roman. This idea of a possible stalemate that you think is certainly not there yet makes it sound like there's nothing going on in the battlefield. But how difficult is it for Ukraine to even sustain the current positions to hold them from Russian attacks? Well, at the moment, uh, Ukraine is holding back all those attacks. Uh, um, and when you look back um, uh, one year, uh, Russia was able to, um, uh, to take just two or three smaller cities. Bakhmut is the biggest, Solidar near it, and now they are trying to do the same in Avdiivka, which is by Donetsk, very close. And how they did it, they just pushed a lot of soldiers. Not, not by uh, far uh, superiority, of course they have it, they have the air superiority, which is very important, maybe Gustav Gressel could say more about it, but uh, one of the major reasons for Russian success there uh, in retaking those cities uh, was that they have a lot of soldiers. Ukraine, Ukraine uh, doesn't have so many soldiers. That's why Russia will be pushing again this winter. Uh, Ukraine has enough forces uh, to stop that uh, or maybe to slow down, but it doesn't have enough force to completely stop it or uh, to try a, a new offensive in the near future. Maybe next year when they've accumulated new brigades, they're trying to do this um, and they will probably um, make one more attempt next year but it is still unclear how successful Russia will be in this winter. Now, we are talking about, a, um, or there has been a lot of talk about, a war of exhaustion, which means that Russia would essentially extend this war for years and years, uh, and that Russia has a bigger capability of actually achieving that because it can supply its military better. Kazina, do you think this is happening already? Is this the way we're going? I think so, yes, I'm afraid. So what we see is that in Russia there is almost still no protest against the mobilization. The recruitment goes as it goes. So recently there was a new letter of, uh, yeah, not protest, but uh, a kind of res res resolution by soldiers' mothers who were 
um, saying, demanding to get their soldiers back just uh, for a kind of holiday, for rotation and so on. But they didn't criticize the war at all. They didn't say, stop this war, it makes no sense, or uh, Putin, go away. There was uh, no fundamental criticism. So there is still a huge majority of people in Russia, in the Russian society, who are silent and who are not definitely not against the war, if not in favor of the war. And the second point is money and technologies. And this is a very important issue that um, Russia is still able to deal, to cope with the sanctions and even to produce weapons because they get the necessary components uh, via China, via Turkey and so on. So some of the predictions, Gustav, that uh, had been done in the past, that Russia would not be able to supply its military, uh, that the money would run out, that there would be social protests in the country, or even some attempts uh, to get Putin out of power have not really become reality. Um, what, what do you think is the reason why the Russian soldiers and the Russian army still continues to apparently be untouched? Well, there are multiple reasons. On the political side, I think uh, most of the talk about regime change in Russia was wishful thinking. Um, Putin has for a very long time trying to solidify his authoritarian regime. The level of repression in Russia is unprecedented and the war helped to, to stabilize that even further because if you protest, I mean, in, the, in the past time you went to jail if you protest against the president, now you go to the front, you're going to be mobilized if they catch you protesting, which is much more dreadful uh, uh, as a threat uh, to your personal life and safety uh, than just going to jail. So uh, they, he will stay in power. The second thing about sanctions, first of all, sweeping sanctions like tried, uh, there is no precedent. Uh, we haven't sanctioned so tightly another country in, in the recent past, another big country. So we actually didn't know how good it's going to work. Uh, the problem is some flaws or some cracks appeared. First of all, of course, large parts of the rest of the world don't carry sanctions. And the, the weight of the West as such is not what it used to be globally, economically, technology. You, can, you have alternatives in China, etc. But the second thing is um, sanctions have a lot of loopholes or gray zones where they slip through. In the European Union, sanctions are monitored and implemented by each member state. You have countries like Hungary or Austria that have signed sanctions, but in theory should supervise them. Austrian police or Hungarian police and prosecutors should bring sanctions um, violations to court. Have they? No. Um, you still have a lot of stories about German enterprises, Austrian enterprises, using either these countries in the media or directly going into it, supplying Russia and the Russian war machine. You have intermediaries like Turkey, which in theory is an NATO member, but in practice is one of the biggest smugglers of illicit goods into Russia. Um, and uh, there is no big recipe to stop that. We had, for example, when people said, yeah, R Russia might run out of missiles. We had, at the beginning of the war last year, the Russian war economy had great difficulties adjusting to sanctions because suddenly they didn't get that, suddenly they didn't get that. There were large piles in, for example, factories producing tanks and infantry fighting vehicles where they were waiting for just small items that were somewhere clocked in, in, in the line. Uh, and people said, oh, they don't put out anything anymore. Um, so if the losses continue and they don't put out anything, if you are, you know, linearly ex um, extrapolate this chart, Russia's going to lose. The problem is, of course, Russia adjusted and the chart was never linear. Um, uh, unfortunately, Russian war production is going up quite substantially. But then and I would ask, uh, Roman, why haven't we seen... Volodymyr Zelensky, the Ukrainian president, for example, calling for even tougher sanctions or other ways to stop this if apparently the Russian army is enabled right now. Well, he has tried. Um, he has tried and he said, I remember very well uh, him saying, uh, we have uh, stopped hearing about new sanctions for some time. Okay, we're hearing about them again now, but there was kind of a pause. Uh, and um, it, it looks like the West uh, is saying, well, well, there's not much what can, we can do about it. So we've already imposed so much, uh, we, we can hardly uh, do more. But we can, actually. You can, uh, you can still um, 
stop doing business with Russia or r radically reduce it. And, and this will, if you ask me, I think this will uh, decide the outcome of this war, how successful the West will be in putting pressure on Russia economically. And this is also something which is not so difficult because in Germany here, especially here in Germany, we have this uh, pacifistic movement. We have problems with supplying Ukrainians with certain kinds of weapons. We're still not giving them the Taurus uh, missiles. Uh, but we could put economic pressure much more than we've done before by we, I mean Germany, as the biggest country in the European Union. And this is the, w the way to, to end this war. Because if you, if you look at history, you look at the past, Russia lost this, uh, the First World War because of econo economic problems at home. This is, this is the only way combined with sustained uh, delivery of weapons and artillery shells. Just, just one example, I've, I've been hear hearing and reading a lot uh, Western expert, uh, experts in the past days. One of them, the, an American, Michael Kaufman, he said uh, North Korea um, had delivered more artillery shells to Russia than the West. So this is his, uh, his, his idea. I don't know if uh, Gustav uh, Gressel agrees with that, but this, this is something we should think about it. Yeah, for sure. We will have a look at the arms specifically and the weapons, because in Ukraine there is growing fear that the Western allies could abandon the cause. A whole set of high-level Western visitors in recent days have tried to dispel that concern, from German Defense Minister Boris Pistorius to the President of the European Council, Charles Michel, and the U.S. Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin. A powerful statement from the U.S. Secretary of Defense on his trip to Kyiv. I announced today uh, another $100 million uh, drawdown using presidential drawdown authority that it'll provide additional artillery munitions, uh, additional um, interceptors for uh, air defense, uh, and uh, in a number of uh, anti-tank weapons as well. But that's a drop in the ocean compared to U.S. President Biden's support package of more than $61 billion currently being blocked by Congress, making it increasingly more clear that Europe must step up. This is another reason why Germany has promised billions of euros in additional aid. But the EU cannot keep its promise to immediately send a million artillery shells. Production must be ramped up and accelerated. That is the order of the day. But we won't reach the one million mark. The West is still united in the fight against Vladimir Putin's forces. But Ukraine urgently needs ammunition and more funding for both the war and reconstruction. Can Europe deliver more to Ukraine than just symbolic support and empty promises? We are seeing fading support, especially in the U.S. Because, you know, how alone is Europe in dealing with this crisis right now? I think what's really crucial is that we have to understand, and by we I mean Democrats all over the world, but especially also in Europe and Germany, and we have to understand that this war is not only Russia's aggression against Ukraine, it's a war against Democrats, it's also our war. And we have to acknowledge this and draw consequences. So this is why we have to support Ukraine much more. This uh, saying, like, as long as it needs, it, as long as it takes, is not enough. We have to define and develop a strategy what we want to achieve. And it must be the aim that Russia gets out of Ukraine, which uh, Russia has uh, illegally occupied. Here in the West, we tend to forget what was just um, before this war. And there was an ultimatum by Vladimir Putin exactly. to NATO. What he basically said, get back, pull back uh, where you were in 1997. Mm -hmm. So the whole of Central and Eastern Europe should get out of NATO and be neutral, so to say. And this would mean that Russia will dominate the European continent. Yeah. And that's still the goal. But Gustav, what would need to happen in order for Ukraine to really achieve a breakthrough with the current conditions, with the current support and with the current perspectives, especially in the US? Well. There are two elements. The first is quantity of support. There's insufficient, there's lack of quantity of what's been delivered. Uh, we saw a continuation or a replenishment of Ukrainian forces by especially Eastern and Central European allies using old Soviet equipment. They still had left over from NATO, transition to NATO equipment or NATO standard Western equipment. That was delivered and kept Ukraine in the fight last year. Then. 
We had a tiny attempt of the West stepping in, the endless debates about tanks and other vehicles um, to supply at least old stocks called war equipment, like Leopard 1 tanks, M113 one, APCs, etc., that are left over from the troop reduction after the Cold War and could now supply Ukraine. This will keep Ukraine roughly in the fight this year and the beginning of next year. Uh, but Ukraine, everybody's talking about drones, but still ordinary weapon systems, tanks, infantry fighting vehicles are still necessary to keep the war fighting. Currently, Ukraine outbuilds the entire European continent on infantry fighting vehicles. Um, if the West doesn't ramp up production, not only in artillery ammunition, on other systems as well necessary to just keep on the fight, Ukraine will be out of material in 2025. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is the quality. Uh, the technical obstacles Solution mentioned, uh, they are there. There are ideas how to overcome them. They need to be tested. There's also the issue of system integration. We have drones and other technology disrupting the kind of, I, I, I shall call it workflow, not to bother you with military terms of mechanized forces. They have to stop for a lot of things, slow down, decentralize, otherwise they can't do their stuff. Um, if drones could be better integrated in normal mechanized units, you could increase the speed of the workflow and again go into movement warfare. Uh, electronic warfare, integrating electronic warfare in that as well, using for example drones and other pilots as antenna systems. There are a lot of ideas floating around. They all will be tested out and they need to be tested out in this war, whether this works or not. How to integrate old conventional weapon systems like tanks that you still need, but which are which you're not able to use properly unless you also master drone defense, electronic warfare, reconnaissance. And to integrate them into one fighting unit properly synchronized. That will take time. That will necessitate continue testing, improvements, etc. And then it will take effect. This, uh, and this is a long-term thing. The problem is we live in a state where Ukraine has to live with promises from this month to the other. There is no coherent industrial strategy in the West how to get the quantity right and how to work with Ukrainian field commanders to get the quality right, to produce not only what we think was good beating the Red Army in 1985, but which is suitable for beating the Russian army in 2023. And that certainly plays into the hands of Vladimir Putin, Gazina. What's the talk in Russia? What's the perspective from Russia? Do they think that things are going well? In the society, there is almost no talk. This is what I want to say at first. Mm -hmm. But in the elites, well, Putin is repeating what he says, uh, what he has been saying, that, that uh, the aim must be to denazify Ukraine. Uh, recently, he has been asked uh, where the operation will stop. He said that it's not about territories, it's about supporting our Russian, our Russians, and how he is very flexible in uh, in uh, defining this. And this is, by the way, um, very important if we discuss what we can do, what the West can do to support Ukraine. It's not about military support, not about financial support. Russia is not only fighting a military war against Ukraine, it's also trying to destabilize uh, democracies. And this is a point where every Democrat should stand up and discuss with those who uh, do not like democracy anymore and who are in favor of authoritarian regimes like in Russia. A narrative that, however, is very difficult to win. We can and should talk about dialogue in any program dealing with war, of course. Woman Gazina at the beginning of the show said that Vladimir Putin is only acting as if he is open to dialogue. Do you agree with that assessment? Of course. So. Uh, um We've seen this before. Remember uh, 10 years ago when Russia first invaded Ukraine undercover with all those green men on the Crimean Peninsula? Um, the West played his game and uh, said to Ukraine, don't intervene, don't shoot. Well, uh, Ukraine had little choice at that time, but that was a mistake because what followed was Russian preparation for this big war. Russia used the time that it had and all those um, uh, 
freedom supporters and uh, people here in the West saying no weapons. The US administration said no weapons to Ukraine, don't escalate. So that was a failure and it's obvious. Now we are in a, even in a, in a more dangerous situation because Russia is now strong enough uh, and it believes with the support of other countries it can win this war. We'll see how that plays out. It's certainly going to be a difficult time and a difficult winter, especially for the people in Ukraine. To all three of you, thank you so much for being with us today. To you, thank you so much for watching. And remember that you can always watch our YouTube videos by searching DW News. Of course, also all the To The Point shows. I'm Poeira Arguedas. Until next time, take care and goodbye.